I'm going to do a range test in my Model 3. The point of this range test is to test it at ultra cold temperatures, minus 15 Fahrenheit. And the point is to see how much this hurts the range of an electric car. This is my usual test loop that closely represents EPA range. And it's 82 miles the loop. Well, the full test is 82 miles. I run the same loop two directions to equalize for wind and elevation and it takes a couple hours so my average moving speed in nice weather is 48 miles per hour or so in cold weather it's going to be a little less because of the snow but we'll check the overall average here's the temperature of the battery before I start my test it's charged to 100% or 99% it says I think because it's a little cool the minimum cell temperature is 11.25 C and the max cell temperature is 20.25 C okay getting in the car this morning if you hear the motor battery heater is running where it runs the motors in an inefficient state to heat the battery you can just hear this and the battery's down to 93%. Some of that is cold related, or most of that's probably cold related. Um, outdoor temperatures, minus 15 Fahrenheit, which is around minus 20 C or so. And then our, or even colder than that, I think, the BMS is indicating that, or the battery system is indicating that it's Minus 16 C is the coldest cell and minus 7.5 C is the warmest cell. So I'm going to go ahead and start the car now. I'm just sitting here waiting for the car to clear. The battery's down to 91%. It's been heating the battery more. So our minimum temperature is at minus 15.5 C and max temperature is at minus 10.5 C. You notice the max temperature actually went down when the minimum temperature went up. And what I suspect there is it's circulating the coolant through the battery and causing it to uh, equalize in temperature. When I was discussing the battery heater the Model 3 uses two motors, or the motors in the car, to run current through them in an inefficient way. By inefficient, I mean it's keeping the rotor stalled and running current through it to uh, generate heat. And that heat is transmitted to the battery via the coolant loop. So it actually is a smart way to not have a separate heater in as long as you have good thermal control of your motors so you don't damage them doing it. Switching over to the tire pressure screen, you can see they're all 33 PSI. I set them just a few days ago and it's all temperature related. You can see this nice, lovely weather here. Everything's frozen, the car is frozen. It squeaks and rattles like crazy. So. All right, well, let's go ahead and drive. Turn off the phone. We'll have to see if I'm able to complete my driving test. I'm hitting snow drifts a foot deep sometimes. So they're just narrow things that are easy to get across, but it may not be able to, may not be able to do this drive. And I'm just a few miles from town, my house. And by the way, I'm already down to 86% battery and just a few miles from the house. Now that I'm getting going, you can see that my average is gonna drop down around 400, 500, uh, actually closer to 600 watt hours per mile. And uh, yeah, it's going pretty good. So my speed is a little lower than my usual test of this loop, but at the same time, the heater's on, so the heater actually uses more energy the slower you go, and the, the 
because it's a time-based draw, whereas the speed is going faster adds more resistance, wind resistance. I'm not trying to get an exactly the same speed test. It's more just to show how much this hurts your battery. A lot of people think you can't drive electric cars in this weather. They do just fine. You just have to be aware that the amount of energy contained in your vehicle is less than it is in gasoline, especially for generating heat. For generating distance, it's really good, but heat takes a lot of energy to generate efficiently, which a combustion vehicle does for free because you have all the excess heat and you're just capturing some of that to heat it. I'm not saying it's a good thing. This electric car still uses less energy over, you know, while driving in this weather, but the difference is less than it is in warm weather. I just passed some foot deep drifts on the other direction, so hopefully the snow plow comes by. I bet he's already been on this side of the road and he's probably going back the other way now. Speaking of the devil. That was the snow plow, so that's good. So by the time I go back the other way on my loop, the road should be cleared. Those guys have been working nonstop the last week to clear the roads. In this cold weather, the snowpack is actually pretty high traction. Um, as soon as it warms up a little bit, it gets really slick when it starts melting. But if there's, you know, minus 15 Fahrenheit it is out here, uh, the snow is so frozen that it actually provides decent traction. I mean, it's still slick, but on the friction, like if you slam your brakes, the friction from your brakes will cause it to melt at the top. Okay, now that the battery is mostly heated up and uh, I've been driving for a while so the cabin's heated, the heater's cycling on and off, uh, my UC or my energy consumption has dropped to about 400 watt hours per mile. That's probably 50% higher than it usually is out here or even more almost closer to twice. So it's it's still using a lot of energy. And we'll do more testing like once I get closer to the end of the loop. But the first 22 miles, we've been closer to 600 watt hours per mile, 550 watt hours per mile. And then, like I said, the once it starts reaching a constant temperature, this is going to be your highway cruising range down here. But for I'm just showing the efficiency over one trip. And it, it'll be much higher from that. I'm wrapping up my first test loop. And finally, after like an hour, it turned off max heating. Max heating on the climate was on the entire drive. And I'm not sure what tells it to set that or not, but even in automatic, it just said max heating. I was able to turn down the, the temperature, but overall, it's nice and comfortable here. I mean, I keep it a little on the cool side to save some energy, but it's going well. The last five miles energy use jumped way up though and that's mostly just because of in town and uh, overall we're, we're sitting right at about 450 watt hours per mile on the highway and that's probably going to be your long distance uh, consumption there whereas the trip meter is telling 500 watt hours per mile but that includes um, that beginning area where it was running really hot. This only shows the past 30 miles, whereas this goes back 40 miles. I just wanted to show you something quick. So my trip average so far has been 
500 watt hours per mile, but my highway average was around 450 to 400, you know, 450 or so is probably about right. And then the, the last five miles where I've been driving in town, it's closer to 500 watt hours per mile. And so a good 10% higher. And that's mostly because I'm driving slow, the heater has a bigger percentage effect on the efficiency. There's a really cool sunrise today, sun dogs, and the halo. happens when the atmospheric air is really, really cold. And you get rainbows off the ice crystals in the atmosphere. Okay, I'm on the last leg of my trip and have a nice sunrise right in my face. Uh, it looks pretty, but it's right in my face. So, my car is a resistance heater model, and one of the reasons I wanted to do a super cold temperature test is the resistance heater doesn't make a difference at minus 15. The heat pump is not gonna save you much. Now, if you're not familiar uh, with resistance heaters and heat pumps, resistance heater is simply an electric resistance heater. You're running an electrical current through a wire and as that electric current moves through the wire, it causes it to put off heat. So, for example, if you have a copper wire, that's a really bad resistance heater because copper is really low resistance. That's why they use it for like all your battery wiring in your car and stuff. So, if you what you do is you have a special metal uh, that is highly resistant to electric current flowing. And when that happens is it puts off heat and that heat is used to heat up the, the car air in this situation. And that resistance heating is actually very efficient. It's 100% efficient based on your electrical current in, all of it's going to heat energy. But usually for an electric car, you want better than 100% efficiency. And that's usually something you can't get unless you do something different like in the case of a heat pump it's moving heat from outside into the cabin and even though it's cold outside there's still energy in the air that it can take and move into the cabin and so that makes it more than 100 percent efficiency heat pumps are really good like at uh, right around freezing temperatures and they're like three or four hundred percent efficient whereas the electric resistance heating is only 100%. But when you get to minus 15, there's not much energy in the air outside that the heat pump can move in. So, you know, depending on the design of the system, it will be slightly more efficient, maybe down to zero or minus 10. But once you hit minus 15 or so, it's, it's pretty much a wash, which is different, better for heat pump or resistance heat. So, uh, the resistance heater won't make any difference in today's test, or very, very little, because uh, that's kind of the goal. I wanted to see what the kind of worst case was. And uh, so far, my driving average has been 488 watt hours per mile. And I purposely included some of my sitting still in the charge, you know, when the battery was warming itself. Uh, I put a car in drive so it would get fooled into calculating how much energy was used. And that number is at 500 watt hours per mile. So, but I just wanted to show you how low your range will be in these situations and why I want a car with a 500 mile EPA range. Uh, this car has 310 mile EPA range and I'm at 71 miles and it says I have 55 miles remaining. So we're looking at about 125, 130 mile range out of 310 EPA. So this is plenty to get me supercharger to supercharger, but 
having 500 mile range would mean I could skip a supercharger. So 500 would really be like, say 200 miles real world range at this temperature. Now it's kind of a corner case, but you know, there's a lot of people living in this corner case. And that, so it, it really makes sense to have an EV with 500 mile EPA range. You know, it's not for everyone, but you know, it's nice to have one available. And we do have a few, like the Lucid, and, but there's not very many and they're super expensive, so they're not accessible vehicles. But I will say, for cold weather cars, this is my favorite car I've owned. Even though the range is much less, it's still my favorite car. Because it, it just runs and drives, it's very stable, like the handling is really good, and the traction control is excellent. And the car just really excels at cold weather. Like it, it, you know, my gas car back in the day would always have trouble starting when it was this cold if I parked outside. Uh, it would, you know, it also uses a lot of gas at this level, but you kind of get the heat for free from gas car because that heat is just going out the exhaust pipe if you don't use it. So that that is kind of the bonus. It's not that they use less energy in the winter, it's that you can actually make them more efficient in the winter by capturing that heat. So, or you make the efficiency of your gas, and how much energy you extract from the gas better. But even in the summer, you're burning that extra heat and that heat is just totally wasted. So, even though this is getting really bad at efficiency, it's still better than electric gas. Car. But, yeah, overall this car's done really well. Other than, you know, how much energy it uses. It takes energy to make heat. Finishing up my drive, the temperature is still minus 14. The coldest it got was minus 16. If we look at the temperature or the of the cells, um, min temperature is minus 1.75 C, max is 13 C. So the battery is still really cold. Um, we still have a blue snowflake there. Uh, tire pressures were 36 to 37 psi. 41 kilowatt hours, 492 watt hours per mile and my average speed was a little slower than usual. It took me two hours, 12 minutes to drive because at night I wanted to drive a little slower. With the final numbers of around 41 kilowatt hours and uh, just under 500 watt hours per mile, that would give me a 100% range of around 130 miles with my slightly degraded battery. From the wall, I was about 52 kilowatt hours. This would give me a total watt hours per mile of about 634, which is really low 
1.57 miles per kilowatt hour. Despite that, it's still about 52 MPGE, which is just looking at the total energy used. So even at such bad efficiency, it's still more efficient than most gas cars. 